Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I am Vishal Khandelwal and this is the One Percent Show. This show is an open-ended exploration into the minds of the wisest people around to help us learn to think, invest, and live each day a little, as little as one percent better. You can learn more at vishalkhandelwal.com. My guest today is uh, Monish Pabrai. Uh, Monish is the founder and managing partner of Pabrai Investment Funds and also the author of two amazing books titled "The Dhando Investor" and "Mosaic." perspectives on investing he's an engineer by training and was running an it services firm in the 1990s before starting to manage money monish is an outlier in the world of investing given that he is a rare investor who has chucked ego out of the door as he calls himself a shameless cloner in fact he has been quoted as saying i am a shameless copycat everything in my life is cloned i have no original ideas One of uh, his favorite investors is Nick Sleep of Nomad Investment Partnership, who, as Monish has said, has transformed his investing style. In one of his letters for Nomad Capital, Sleep wrote, and I quote: "Investing is a wonderful, thoughtful adventure, but it can also be self-centered, a tendency that can be reinforced by the wealth that can follow." We think it is true that once past X amount, real meaning comes with reinvesting in society through charitable giving. which can also be thoughtful challenging wonderful adventure but with the added bonus that it feels like the world working properly now this description fits monish to the t given that he has also running the dakshina foundation that provides comprehensive scholarship and support for very impoverished and very bright kids to undergo one to two years of intensive coaching before taking the iit entrance exam in india in short he is transforming the lives of countless kids pulling them out of and their families out of poverty by giving them opportunities that might otherwise be unthinkable in today's show among other things we are going to talk about the biggest lessons monish has learned from the people with whom he has been in closest in life like his father warren buffett charlie munger nick sleep and guy spear but before that and with no further delay monish welcome to the 1% show and thank you for agreeing to do this Well, uh, Vishal, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think you do a great service uh, for uh, for just the common man. And I think you you help help people uh, very well by helping them becoming better at uh, better at investing and better at managing their money and growing wealth and uh, and financial stability and all that. So I think it's it's really wonderful. it's things that should be part of core cbse curriculum before 12th standard but it's not there so we need you so thank you it's my pleasure monish in fact uh, as i've i've mentioned uh, several times i i've all i've done is like as newton said uh, walking on the soldiers of uh, giants like you right so i've learned a lot from you from warren and charlie right and and all i am doing is trying to pass on those learnings in in a simple language to people who need them the most so thank you so much for your kind words uh so just uh, to get started right i i i take you uh, 20 years back when you were still running your tech company and you hired two industrial psychologists to assess you they revealed how ill suited you were to manage a large staff and that you were wired to be working best all alone which you have actually done over the past 20 years and that came uh, at a time when you were almost on the verge of starting your investment firm the rest as they say is history Now while researching for this conversation I went to the website of one of those psychologists who is Jack Skeen and the question right up on his home page is what makes you feel the most alive and that is my first question to you Monish what makes you feel the most alive Well uh I mean I think that uh I was lucky to I stumbled upon uh upon Jack Skeen and and Jim Dethmer his other partner they were together then now they've kind of uh gone on different uh different journeys uh but yeah so uh you know i i think that uh i didn't realize uh how how far out of alignment i was and uh and so uh, really i think uh, uh and and i was you know i think what happens with with most of us is that we can tell when we are unhappy with something like i mean if you have a job and you're not excited in the morning to go to work and such then you know that there's some issue there or if you have a relationship and you know again it's kind of dragging whatever so you know there's issues there and 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 if that persists for a while uh then probably worth uh 
taking some action uh, to try to try to try to fix things. Uh, so, uh, actually, for me, uh, this is at least definitely in the last, I think, 20, 22 years, maybe even even earlier than that. Uh, I always try to look at uh, what uh, what would make me happy and what would get me excited. So when I'm trying to you know figure out different things to do during the day or you know planning planning things in the future and so on, uh, that's the overriding thing. I, I look at uh, and and uh, one of the ways I get to it is that. I, I do a postmortem on things that have happened. So let's say, for example, I meet someone for lunch and, you know, we have a conversation, whatever. And when I come back, I ask myself, you know, how was that? You know, how was, how was the meeting? And uh, was it, was it great or exceptional? How was it? And if it's, if it really didn't kind of, you know, move me in some way, whatever, or, you know, had uh, really off the charts kind of, uh, take home value or whatever I probably will not meet that person again for lunch or or dinner or whatever so so basically I think the thing is one of the things I learned from Mr. Buffett is uh, you have to be really good at saying no and I learned from Warren uh, that he he hates to say no uh, but he has to say no a lot just to keep sanity he has to say no a lot and uh, so I think that uh, what makes us alive, what makes me feel alive is really, it's really the end result of a process of culling. So less is more. So uh, you, you, uh, you cut out uh, as many of the things that you can that aren't, uh, aren't that exciting to you. And one of the things I find very funny when I talk to my friend Guy Spear is he's excited about doing three different things at the same time. You know, and he's he's always struggling with, oh, I want to go here and do this, and I want to be here and do that as well. And so he's always got these multiple uh, things that he's trying to do. I I don't tend to have that problem. I I uh, I have really I would I would say very basic uh, needs in life. I don't have uh, very esoteric needs. Uh, when I was running my IT company. Uh, and when I had first started the company, when I was just kind of bootstrapping it, uh, there was a there was a Chinese restaurant which was about you know two three miles from my from my office, and every day for about I think four years, I carried out the exact same lunch from that restaurant every day. You know, I really liked it a lot. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it was, it was to a point this is before the internet and everything, right? It was to the point that when I used to call and say, hello, they used to say 10 minutes, you know, when they, they, we didn't need to talk anymore. I just say, hello, they say 10 minutes and that's it. And then I just go and, and it was $4 and 27 cents uh, for a meal. It was a good meal. And, uh, and I missed that, you know, actually, so my office moved and I couldn't go, go back and I, I, so to me, I don't need a lot of variety. I just need uh, things that I like. I like that place. And even uh, even now, every year, once a year, I go back to Chicago and have one meal at that at that same restaurant. And now the the couple has retired and this kids are running the place. Uh, but anyway, so I think the the what makes me alive and what makes me excited is is a process of a of, of feedback driven mechanism where I do an activity, ask myself, how do I feel about it? What do I like, don't like? And basically, I just, I don't really care what other people think. I care about what, how the glove fits on me. And so, uh, like, I love playing bridge. So I play a good amount of bridge. I love reading. I do that. Uh, I don't really enjoy having a lot of things on my calendar or meeting people for lunches and dinner. So there's very little of that. So, uh, and then when I do all of that, I'm really happy because I'm basically living life the way I want to live. Great. Uh, uh, so uh, the, in a sense, you're saying your ability to say no to a lot of things which don't really matter, right? Has helped you live a life and find a life that you really are actually living, right? So that, that's the essence that I can draw out. Um, less, really less, yeah. Yeah, less is more. Less is more. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Manish, we are living in a world of FOMO, right? So uh, you you've learned uh, over the years, you've evolved over the years, right? But for someone starting out or someone like in, right in the middle of the journey, right? We are surrounded by a lot of noise and a lot of fear of missing out factor, right? So, uh, what what qualities or how does one actually get over uh, uh, this or, or or develop this quality of saying no, right? So because it's all there upon us, right? It's an attention economy that we are living in. So. How have you done that in that over the over the past few years? Yeah, so actually, it's it's interesting. Like, so for example, uh, you know, in in '94, I was uh, vacationing with my wife in London, and I was looking for something to read on the way back, and I read this book by Peter Lynch, and that was the first time I read an investing book in my life. You know, I've never, uh, and then I, you know, I got interested. I went, I went next book, and then that led me to Buffett, and I started digging. What I find in a lot of humans is that they will encounter something they like mm-hmm. or something that's of interest, but then they don't take it further. Uh, and and I think that for me, the thing is I'm, uh, you can say, uh, obsessive compulsive. Okay, So in the sense that if I find something is of interest, I want to keep digging. Okay, Like, for example, uh, I've known I've known Nick Sleep for probably more than 15 years, 15 or 17 years, long time, but not much interaction. You know, once in a while I would meet him. He was in California or sometimes in Omaha, I'd bump into him. Once in a while he'd send me his letters. It was kind of very sporadic, you know, and he's really Guy Spears' friend. That's how I got to know him. And uh, I had not really kind of kept in touch with what, what Nick had been up to. And then when uh, William Green sent me a galley copy of his book, which was about a year ago, um, the Nick Sleep chapter really kind of, I said, wow, I, he, he's been on this journey. He went from Zimbabwe cement to Amazon, which is quite a leap. And, uh, and, um, and he's left Zimbabwe cement behind and he's gone all in on Amazon, which is great. And, and so I wanted to drill more, right? I, I, I wasn't satisfied with just what William has written. So I talked to William. He gave, gave me more data about his interaction. Then I contacted Nick. And then he sent me all his letters. And I went through that. Then I again had some exchanges with him. So it was it opened up a, 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 nice, a nice world for me. And, and actually seeing that trajectory that he went through uh, helped me help me make uh, this leap and the, the leap is actually it's it's a difficult leap uh, it was a difficult leap for Buffett I think it was a relatively easy leap for Charlie he's just you know he's not human so he can leap pretty quickly uh, but but Warren I think even today um, is not completely there. And I'm not completely there, you know. Uh, so this, the the notion of, uh, you know, investing in good businesses and paying up for them um, is not an easy notion when you try to balance it against other options and other things that are going on and such. So it's a, it's a fascinating area. And it's, you know, part art, part science. So for example, so that's an area, like I said, it's it's a journey that I'm on and I want to know and learn more. But what I find with a lot of other humans is they'll encounter something and they'll they'll read a book. It's interesting for them, but they'll just move on. You know, they'll move on to something else. They don't. So I think what you have to do is you have to, if something grabs you, it means it's hitting something in your psyche or whatever. You have to be willing to go down that rabbit hole. And you have to be willing to go down the rabbit hole till you get to the end of the rabbit hole and have satisfied yourself right. that, okay, I want to be in this rabbit hole or no, this is not for me. Let me keep walking. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just find that a lot of humans just don't do that. And uh, the successful ones, I think, um, go there. So, you know, you can be a mile wide and an inch deep, or you can be an inch wide and a mile deep. So I think I think the uh, the willingness to just dive in to something that you encounter when you're just kind of scanning the radar is an important thing to pay attention to. 
Right, right, right. Uh, 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 talking about Nick's sleep, right? So uh, it's good you talk, talked about him, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you have evolved a lot over the past 20, 21 years of being an investor in public markets, right? In 1999, as, as when you started really managing other people's money, right? You, you mentioned that you were a classic Graham style investor, right? And you were looking to buy dollars for 50 cents and sell when the stocks actually became overvalued. And you did it very successfully for the past 20 years, right? But in an interview last year, and you mentioned, and you mentioned just now as well that, right? Uh, you've, you've actually shifted focus to now trying to find those long-term compounders with long runways, right? And even if the stock looks a bit like price, you're li a little bit overvalued at this point of time, right? And you want to keep holding on to those kind of compounders till the story or till the business remains good, right? And you mentioned that you 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 learned deeply, much more deeply uh, about this idea from Nick Sleep, uh, uh, who has been your friend for many years, right? Right. Tell us about your transition. So we know the starting point where you started like a Graham, Graham kind of investor. Now you're talking about evolution to being a, a holder of business for a long term, but from a long term perspective, holding on to those compounders for many years. How has been your evolution been? What are those most critical lessons that you've learned as an investor in the past 20 years of your life? Yeah, so actually, I didn't start as a Graham investor. I actually started as a investor investing in good businesses. So when I, if you go further back, 94, when I first started investing for 94 to 99, I was doing investing just for my own own money, own portfolio. In that period, it was a very heavily focused on looking at good businesses, good businesses. And, and specifically what I was interested in, because my experience as when I was running the IT firm, uh, it what it had shown me is that very small amounts of capital with uh, effort and uh, some intelligence applied yielded enormous returns. I mean, literally, uh, there, were, there were some businesses that I started where I think the money that went in must have been less than 10 or 20,000. And very soon it was making more than a couple of hundred thousand. Uh, so I had seen that directly uh, with a direct experience in my business and I was looking for that in the in the public markets and that's what how I, how I invested and from 94 to 99 it was like you know 70% a year it, it had a million had become about 13 million it had done really well the issue that came up was in 99 2000 I could see that there was a massive bubble uh, you know the dot com bubble was coming about and there was change coming but there was also incre incredible euphoria. And I was able to just uh, see things maybe a month or two ahead of most of the other people. Just maybe I was not that far ahead, but I could see things a little bit further ahead. So when Pabrai Fund started in the middle of 99, uh, in our first year, we were up more than 70%. So from mid 99 to mid 2000, we were up more than 70%. The NASDAQ, peaked in March of 2000 and then started crashing. And in fact, for the next eight or nine years, I was up, you know, uh, more than 35% a year before fees. And the NASDAQ went from 5,000 to 1,200 in the next two, three years. So everything crashed, but I didn't crash. And the reason I didn't crash is that in 99, I was really concerned about valuations. And then when I was trying to look at, you know, what are you paying for these businesses versus what are you getting in cash flows? I said, this is, this makes no sense. It made sense five years ago because those numbers were much more palatable, but it, 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 it had moved so much, it didn't make sense. So I completely shifted to Graham because what I found at that same time, the day the NASDAQ peaked was the same day that Berkshire Hathaway hit a multi-year low. They both happened at this on the same day. Literally, people were pulling money out of Berkshire Hathaway and putting it into pets.com. Uh, so that's what was happening. So um, I, I moved away from tech completely, and I moved into businesses that were just, because there was so much money flowing in one particular area, into these neglected things that were not sexy and no one was interested. And... And a lot of those were Graham type bets. They were, you know, arbitrage and different things going on. And that worked really well. And, and the, the, the thing is that what I was supposed to do, which I completely forgot about, is I was supposed to switch back. 
okay i mean the the idea was that okay you know you you go to gram get some cover against this craziness going on then when everything gets back to normal get back to uh, you know being a compounder investor and and i had become so used to that approach of investing that the 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 reversal should have happened maybe around the ideal time to make that reversal would have been 2009 i think a lot of great businesses were really mispriced and underpriced then and if i missed that then probably 2011 2012 was also fine but i missed all of that i missed i missed switching over because in 2009 you could buy great compounders at 10 12 times earnings whatever else but you could find other stuff at two times earnings and of course at this point i would say that the you know if you're buying mastercard or visa at 12 times earnings you know that's a better way to go than uh something else which is a uh, cigar but and such so anyway the um so th- the switch took place later uh than i then then i then i should have made it happen and and it all was not lost because i still found great returns on a number of businesses and investments we made and the uh, where i am today is i'm i'm going through an evolution where i found that you can't go all nixley uh i think i think all nick sleep is uh, i mean the the reason like warren reason that warren buffett does well is because he's a swiss army knife you know he brings out different blades for different different uh uh you know opportunities and and he's willing to go across the spectrum so i think i think the thing is that uh it is it is definitely a great thing to do to buy great businesses and hold them for a long time if you can get them at reasonable prices you can also do really well uh using grams techniques that also works uh so probably the right answer is some mix uh there off and actually the the thing that what i was what i've even been thinking about is can i have my cake and eat it too you know that would be the best and so the the best of all these worlds is to find compounders at gram prices right so everything is possible in a world with 50000 stocks and so for example you know i i got lucky and i invested in this company in turkey in 2019 and this was a business where the business was worth about 5 or 600 million dollars and the market cap was 20 million so it was trading at 4% of you know dollar bill for 4 cents but the second thing on top of what what this business had is it had great assets these are these are really really good assets and incredible capital allocators there's a father son team that run it who are really smart at how they allocate capital and so i bought the business i and i was surprised that i was able to get i i own a third of the company now and i was able to buy a third of the company for 7 million dollars which is great uh that business now is valued at in the market about 120 million or so it's moved up 5 6 times but they have moved the value of the business to maybe 8 or 900 million so what was a 5 or 600 million dollar business is now what 8 or 900 million and i know that they will keep moving it up so i still have a gap right i was 20 million to 5 600 now i'm 120 or 140 million to 8 or 900 million and what i want them to keep doing is keep moving the top line higher and higher so i don't have any decision to make right because a classic gram investor would me would 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 be me would say if it stayed at 500 million and this thing got to 400 million or 450 million let's move on right but what i want to do is i want to keep this forever and and so in my mind i think of myself as an owner of that business and i've decided that just don't bother with it even if the market even if the market cap goes to a billion today for example don't worry about it they're still allocating capital well it might be a little bit overvalued it's okay so we bring in a little bit of nick sleep and we mix it in a little bit of gram 
and and the problem is you can't these are very rare this is exceptionally but but on the other side you don't need more than two or three of these in a lifetime you might even do well with even one in a lifetime so it it can work out really well and so that's the beauty of this this business and the learning and the growth where i'm trying to say can i get the most better the best of both worlds and can i uh try to learn from all these people and uh make it work the way it would work for monish and see what happens the biggest takeaway for me from this uh, uh, response of yours i think this ability to change the mind right uh, uh Uh, with changing times right uh, uh, that that comes very rarely to people uh, uh, we 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 are stuck in a status quo and we we keep on uh, uh, investing the way we invested 20 years back right so but i think that that's what differentiates people who who do really well uh, uh, i ha- i have a question on on the current market right that is factoring in uh, such unrealistic growth prospects uh, and it has become actually virtually impossible for so many businesses to grow into the valuation as you rightly said that such opportunities have become even rarer at this point of time and now we are also seeing uh, businesses becoming more fragile because of uh, rapidly changing technology there's endless amount of money that is being printed by central banks and and of, over the, over that we have a new breed of robin hood investors that does not believe in downsides and, and instead willing to take all the investing rules to the cleaners right in this environment how does how does one maintain sanity right so what you advise in min- terms of maintaining sanity in practice detachment and live and invest with the inner scorecard that you that you've talked about so often in the past right so basically my question is amidst all the hype and overvaluation what qualities you believe could help investors stand a better chance of making optimal decisions for the future yeah so i i actually don't think we have um a uh, mega bubble is i i think the the situation today is very different from 99 2000 99 to 2000 you had everyone and their brother you know pumping all all they could into this massive bubble um i remember in in uh march february or february january february of 2000 i was taking a cab ride in chicago and uh, i used to live in chicago so i was just downtown just going to a cab there was a pakistani cab driver he says to me uh, aapka cisco ke bare mein kya khayal hai okay and uh, you know i'm a i'm a network engineer right actually and that's my specialty okay and cisco was actually it had become the most valuable company in the world you know it, there were there were three companies those ge cisco and microsoft they were all sitting at more than 600 billion and there there was just no way to justify uh that valuation right and uh this is like the 1929 outside the stock market in new york stock exchange the shoe shine by a uh, boy is giving you stock tips you know so that's to me that that was a major red flag uh when when you know a, a cab driver is you know uh hot and heavy on cisco and um, and so uh what i see today i don't see that situation i see a little bit different situation i see a bubble in a very narrow set of assets uh 1992000 was a very large bubble it was massive uh just like in the housing crisis we had a massive bubble in a very large part of the economy this is very narrow so for example in the us we have crazy pricing on gamestop we have crazy pricing on uh on amc on tesla uh, maybe on bitcoin but you can't even i don't think you can even get to 10 or 15 names you know once because there there are all of them are piled into the i mean the if i look at to me gamestop is really pick, funny you know because it's a ridiculously useless company it's completely obsolete um they have no real estate they only have debt and they have leases they have long term leases which have liability on them and everything in video games has gone digital so they have this huge kind of aircraft carrier that they have to keep feeding and paying there is no business and it's not even worth 5 dollars a share you know uh, and so it's it, they've taken it they've taken it to uh, crazy highs and um, if you can issue stock at those high prices and try to do something with it you, can, you might be able to make something out but it's a very it's a very tough uphill battle so what i find now is that 
this complete disconnection from reality in a very small sliver of names, right? And all these guys who are on Reddit and on Robinhood and all of that, they're all focused on those games. And uh, I, I mean, the other day I was talking to this lady and, you know, she's got some kind of a nursing business and such. And she's just, you know, matter of fact, telling me, you know, basically life is really simple. I have a Robin account and every month, whatever money I get, I put into the three stocks. And I said, which three stocks? And it's, you know, it's GameStop, AMC and Tesla. And they all go up and it's all great and everything's fine. You know, that's the portfolio. Okay. So, uh, so I think that this bubble will pop. All bubbles pop at some point, but this bubble is very narrow. It it is not clear to me that Amazon is in bubble territory or Microsoft is in bubble territory. They could be overvalued. Mm -hmm. but they're also exceptional businesses, uh, so they could even grow into that valuation if they don't have that value today. So I'm I'm not of the uh, I'm not in the camp which believes that. Uh, everything is, you know, crazy or whatever. I think that mm -hmm. the craziness is very limited. Um, and probably I think in India it's, it's similar. It might, we, do, we may not even have anything. In, you, get, you get these uh, humans vacillate between fear and greed. And so that's, that's kind of the, the norm with it. But I forgot your, your original question. Your original question was how do you keep sanity? Yeah, how it do you is. keep sanity and amidst all the noise, how do you practice detachment, right? And especially for you, like as a public market investor, your every move is actually being publicized, right? Or even for a normal investor, right? How do you detach from the from the FOMO, from the noise, from from attention, everything that people or or or, or like Buffett said, right? People want you to act, right? But you don't want. Yeah, to. Yeah, but I, I I think that that for me is is rel relatively easy because I mm -hmm. think that it's uh, I'm not particularly interested in winning popularity contests. Uh -huh. You know, I'm not interested in people, uh, you know, so the inner scorecard, outer scorecard that you brought up, uh, I, I think that that has helped me a lot uh, in terms of just framing things internally. So uh, for me, the the hunt, the hunt is all about finding, uh, ideally, the like the business of our in Turkey. Yeah. Okay, that, that's kind of where my, my attention is focused there. Mm -hmm. uh, my my attention is not focused on Tesla and GameStop and whatever else is going on or or and I I don't need to I don't need to figure out is DMART overvalued or undervalued. Okay, it just doesn't fit what I'm looking for, and it doesn't fit the valuation criteria that I'm looking for. So it's fine. And this is the beautiful part about this business is that you can let a lot of great balls go. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to hit on every every ball that's coming at you. And so, uh, so basically, when things line up beautifully, you can you can you know hit a six out the out of the stadium. And the rest of the time, you don't need to do anything. So I think that that model, I think, is for me, it's pretty easy because I just that's how I think. I'm not really particularly concerned with how other people think or what they think. I'm not concerned if people think I'm stupid. Or people think I'm smart or whatever else. I think all that is not very relevant to me. I think I think that's a great advice for people to take as well in general, right? Uh, 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 here I want to bring in Warren and Charlie, uh, two, your two favorite people, right? So Warren has called Charlie uh, uh, the best 30-second mind he has ever seen. And, and if I'm not mistaken, you, you also often ask this question while making decisions, what would Charlie do, right? In that light, and if, if not in 30 seconds, what would you look at in a business as a potential investment if all you have is five minutes, right? So we talked about fragile companies, economies, right? We're, we're, we're talking about disruption, all those kind of things. Amidst all these changing scenarios, right? If you have five minutes to discard a company or choose a company for, for a deeper study, right? What are those key factors that would help you make up your mind either way? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what you want to look for is, first of all, you want to, it's pretty easy to tell if a business has great economics or not, you know, mm -hmm. return on equity, just intrinsically does it does it fit in your head as a great business or not right so that's that's so i'll give you an example just i'll digress a little bit and come back right uh, i've always had difficulty understanding amazon's business model in fact the business model made, never made any sense to me mm -hmm. you know i order a box of band-aid which costs like four dollars or something and it's delivered to me next day at the four dollars, 
with no shipping price. The real cost of getting that to me has to be north of $10 or $20. You know, there's a guy driving a truck and there's a warehouse somewhere and there's multiple warehouses. I mean, there's, there's a whole back-end stuff going on to get that Band-Aid to me. And, and it shows up at the $4 price and Amazon has a $1 margin on it, 25% margin. They have a $1 margin on that. And I think the last mile costs are ridiculous. So to me, it never made sense that this was a good business. And I, I, every time I'd look at Amazon in about two minutes, I'd say, and then, you know, recently I was listening to Jack Ma, uh, Alibaba, and he says the exact same thing. So he says, this makes no sense to us, right? And so he is not willing, Jack Ma has not taken uh, ownership of the inventory and he doesn't control the distribution. He controls the digital pipe. And there's uh, someone else doing the deliveries and someone else who's, you know, taking the inventory risk and all of that. And he's sitting in the middle of all that with the payments and the pipe. And that model makes sense to me. The Amazon model doesn't make sense to me. And Jack Ma said, look, I have 25,000 people. This was a few years back. If I go to the Amazon model, I need 10 million people. He said, I'm having difficulty managing 25,000. I don't know how I can manage 10 million. So I'm not going to go there. So it was two very different approaches, right? It's two. Now, Amazon has made it work. Eventually, basically, they, they made it work. And um, Alibaba has never gone there. The negative with Alibaba's approach is the link to the customer is not as strong. The Amazon approach is you're just locked in. You know, we, we love Amazon, you know. And so so there is a kind of ebb and flow there, right? So, but for me, the thing is, if I was looking at Amazon 30 seconds, I would just not be interested because it intrinsically doesn't make sense. If I looked at something like MasterCard, it would very quickly make sense because they get, you know, a certain percentage of every transaction and it's a bunch of servers, you know, so you, you I mean, it's going to be 80% margin business because, you know, after you have scale, every incremental transaction almost has no cost. So very quickly, you can, you can tell very quickly if a business has great economics or not. That doesn't take much time. What does take more, more time is the durability. So you can tell whether a business is a good business or not. The second question, is it durable? That's a much harder question. Uh, and and you have to run through in your head if you if you going through the thirty seconds, you have to run through in your head all kinds of things about durability. And the the, the easy way, so you know, I'm I'm reading a book by this guy Terry Smith. Uh, Terry Smith runs Fund Smith in the UK. I think thirty billion or whatever under management. So his his answer is he says, look, I don't want to pick winners. Okay, he said picking winners is very hard. I want to call the winner after the race is ended. Okay, so he says that basically once the race has ended, we know who the winner is. And that's who I want to invest with. So what he means by that is he says he has no interest in any companies which don't have a very long history. So he's, he's interested in Nestle with 150 year history where I think there was one quarter they lost money or something, or like Colgate, Pal Palmolive, and, and so on, right? Or Microsoft or whatever. So he's he's saying, these companies already won. Okay, Nestle has won, Microsoft has won, all these companies have won. So I just want to look at all the winners and then just pick from those, right? So his approach is, we know the return equity is high. We know that they have durability because they've already shown they're durable. Who's going to, who's going to take Nestle out? Right? Who's going to take Unilever out? So his approach to that is, I'm going to answer the question in a simple way, which is, it's already the race is already over, right? So I think that if you if you use those two models, if you just have the durability and the return on equity, those are the only things you looked at. You could pretty much in 30 seconds get there with a lot of businesses. I'm sure. I think uh, that's a great insight uh, about durability. Part. Uh, yeah. You you've had a, a hugely successful career, but I'm sure, uh, uh, like all investors, you also have 
you you must have also had had your chances your 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 moments of failures right mistakes right uh, uh, in an interaction with your friend guy uh, spear in 2014 you mentioned you you've actually found failure to be to be your driver of growth and that you thought that you are a much better investor because of a whole bunch of different stumbles uh so here i i uh, want to ask you specifically about this company called digital disruptors that not many people may know of but it was a company that you started in 99 and and and, and as you mentioned somewhere you quickly lost like 1.8 million dollars of your own money and around 2 and 1/2 million dollars of outside investors investors money in that company right and somewhere you also called it as as the biggest investing mistake of your life so take us through the lessons you learned from uh, that failure and 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 that actually set set you up for future success yeah so actually uh, digital digital disruptors was a uh, when i look back it was a wonderful experience and actually in the end it ended up being extremely valuable for me so this is a private business that i had founded i think in 98 uh and the you know i was i was making all these tech investments i was able to see uh, the first time i went on the internet i think was in 94 uh whitehall whitehouse.gov was the first website i saw in 94 and and it was very clear to me as the 90s went on that the internet was transformational so one of the reasons why that bubble became such a big bubble because all bubbles at the core have a kernel of truth you know there is a kernel of truth at the core um and and there was a kernel of truth here which is that this amazing internet technology was going to be transformational and would change a lot of things in a lot of industries that was actually a true statement we we are actually seeing it unfold even now um uh, but the thing is that at that time it was the blind leading the blind right so it didn't have the tread marks of what's going to work and how how things will change and so on so digital disruptors was a uh, was an endeavor which was trying to take uh, old line businesses to create a new new line business in effect it was using clayton christensen's uh, disruptive innovation uh, model which said that uh, you know established businesses will eventually die and they will get disrupted by some you know small scummy business that looks useless kind of like when japanese cars came into the us they were not that good in quality uh they were much uh, uh they were they were thought as a lot a uh, much inferior to the general motors american cars but over time what happened is that the japanese improved their quality and they stuck to small cars and consumers switched to small cars and gm was never able to adapt to that and the end it, it so the disruptor killed the uh the incumbent and so the idea was that we could go to a bank and say look you have your banking model and you're running it but let's set up a digital bank right and let's keep the digital bank separate from the mothership and let this grow on its own um and so i think the model had some uh relevance but i think we had we were trying to do too many things in too many industries at the same time and at the same time while we were doing all of that uh the the whole whole dynamic of everything was shifting you know uh the bubble was about to crest and go on and uh these models would take a long time to get cash flow positive and and so you need a deep pockets and and also we found that we don't have the capital we don't have the runway we don't there were a lot of issues coming up so uh i had raised uh, venture capital i had funded the company myself so you know i had a million dollars in 94 it had become about 13 million so i put some of that money into into digital disruptors the 1.8 million that went in and then outside investors venture capitalists came in as well and then i think by late 99 uh we just realized it's not going to work and so i just tried to salvage and close and help people get get jobs and most most of the team landed on their feet and all that so that was fine and um but what was really helpful with that whole experience was 
I was able to see around the curve a few months before the public markets could see it because I was dealing with this stuff uh, right at the ground level. And so when Pabrai Fund started, it completely sidestepped the entire bubble. Because because of the digital disruptive experience, I understood what the problems of these models were much better than most people understood them. And so I went in a different direction. And uh, so in the end, it actually worked out uh, much better because Pabrai Funds had a lot more capital eventually. Uh, and this was a painful lesson, but it was a great lesson. And I think every time for everyone, we don't grow with success. It, are, it is the failures that help us grow. The success, success really doesn't teach you anything. You just feel good and life is great, but you don't really grow as a person with success. So I'm always grateful for the failures. Uh, the rough times, the tough times, they are the ones that really in the long run give you a lot of dividends. And uh, so we, we should be very grateful for all the failures and stumbles that we have. Uh, uh, was it uh, uh, that, that time after Digital Disruptors that you wrote that letter to Warren Buffett uh, uh, asking to work for free for him? Yeah, so I, I wrote that letter in early 99. Okay. And uh, at that time, I was very clear that I was leaving my IT business. I didn't have an interest in that. Digital Disruptors had was still going on, uh, but I was just trying to figure out what am I doing next and where am I going? And I could see that it might come to an come to an end. And so when I talked to my friends and they quizzed me, I said, the only thing I'm really excited about doing is I want to go work for Warren and I don't need money. I can work for free. And so I wrote him a letter and, uh, and I got, uh, you know, it went by regular mail and within seven days I had a response back from him, which said, thanks, but no thanks. And uh, I work alone. And then he said, in case you think that Charlie works with me, he said, that's actually not true because he's in LA and I'm in Omaha. So good luck. He, his final thing was, he said, good luck reorganizing your life. I am not the answer. Uh, so if I, if I may if were to ask, right, how did you pitch yourself when you wrote that letter to Warren? What did you say that, they, that he should have hired you? Well, I, I just wrote a very candid letter to Warren, which just gave him a very, very quick synopsis of my background, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, immigrant and I started this this business and I had grown the business and I had then learned about him and I had followed his approach and I wanted to just keep that learning growing and I think I thought that the learning and growth would be tremendous and I thought I could also add some value for him and I told him I'm not looking for a job description I'm not looking for a title I'm not looking for a paycheck um, you can pretty much ask me to scrub the flows in Omaha. That's fine. And uh, I just want to learn, right? And uh, so that's that's basically where I just, I just wrote him a very candid letter based on what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I think he was thoughtful about it in terms of it wasn't a form letter that came back. Uh, he was thoughtful about, I think he went through everything I sent him. And, uh, and then uh, that's how he responded. Uh, continuing with Warren, uh, uh, you've experienced him uh, from much closer quarters and for much longer time than most other people have. And what are those things that people miss out when they read or learn or think about him and only find out when they observe him or talk to him in person, right? Or to, or to put it other way, what are your biggest learnings from him that are not so obvious to people who read or study him from far? Yeah, so I think, I think the thing about Warren is that... Uh, you know, like one time uh, someone at an annual meeting asked him, he said, uh, Mr. Buffett, there are 50,000 stocks in the world. How am I supposed to study them all? Right? How am I supposed to, you know? And his answer was, uh, start with the A's. Okay. And actually it wasn't a, it wasn't just a, you know, kind of, gimmicky answer, if you will, or just being a smart aleck. That's exactly what he he did. So in the 50s, when he was running the Buffett partnership, he went through the Moody's manuals. And I actually bought one of the Moody's manuals from eBay just 
for nostalgia's sake. They don't they don't publish them anymore. And it's pretty thick mob uh, book, and it has maybe twenty thousand stocks, and very fine print, and has maybe three four stocks on a page, and it has the salient kind of financial information on each company. And he went through all those manuals like twice. Okay, like it was a lot of that's that's pretty intense work. It would be and pretty much he would be upstairs at home before we moved to the office at pretty much from 7 a.m. in the morning till maybe midnight, other than for meals. He's just going stock by stock by stock. Okay. And one out of a thousand or two out of a thousand, he'd find something that looked interesting. Then he would drill down some more. Right. And so sometimes he would find the company's market cap is $15 million and they made $27 million last year, for example. You know, so he'd find these quirky anomalies, then he'd drill down on them. And then he made some investments based on that, right? So the thing about him that people don't understand is how intense he is about the work he puts in and how uh, how uh, obsessive compulsive he is when he does that. And he still does that. Like, you know, recently when I visited his office, there was a book on his desk called the Japan Company Handbook. And the Japan Company Handbook has half a page on every Japanese company, okay? And when you go through things like the Japan Company Handbook or the Moody's Manual, you are not uh, looking for great businesses, okay? Because you're not gonna be able to find a great business based on the numbers. You will, you will, you will just find Graham type stuff when you look at the numbers. And so the Graham in him is still alive, okay? And even though he understands that I need to buy great businesses, he also spends a lot of time on this weird stuff, right? And so I think what people don't understand about Buffett is how, how intensely he studies stuff and how deep his knowledge is. On, Like, for example, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a friend of mine who used to work at this uh, Illinois, Illinois National Bank in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, Berkshire had bought that bank in 68 or 69. And then they were forced to divest it, I think, in 1980 or something. Uh, so he was an intern at the time when Warren owned the bank. And once a month, Warren would show up at the bank in Rockford, Illinois. And he, he said that two or three days before Warren was coming, the whole bank was like upside down, getting ready for his visit. Uh, because they knew that he's going to ask questions. And, you know, someone else said that Warren never forgets a number. And he's, so they wanted to be fluent on all the questions he's going to ask, right? That was an exceptional bank. They never had a single dollar in NPA or they, they never had any bad debts. I mean, literally the most extreme well-run bank you could imagine. And uh, so there is no banking analyst on the planet today who is better than Warren at banking. And, and the reason is that he's been at it for 50 years and he owned a bank and he studied the hell out of that bank. And, and so, I mean, his, his track record on banking is 100%. There's no bank he's ever invested in that has not worked out. And in fact, many of them have worked out exception, extremely well. So, so I think what people don't understand about now, he also has made a lot of bets in retail that have blown up for him. So his retail record is terrible. Uh, his banking record is exceptional. And, uh, and so I think he, he's continuously living and learning, trying to do things. You know, he made a mistake with IBM, for example. He made a mistake with Tesco in the UK. Uh, he made a lot of mistakes with buying these retailers. Uh, but he's, he's uh, I think what I... What I find that people may not fully understand about him is that he's the opposite end of someone who says, okay, oh, AMC is going up. Let me go buy it. He's the complete other end of it. Uh, talking about Guy Spear, who's, who's been your friend for 15 years, right? Uh, he's written this wonderful book called The Education of a Value Investor, uh, wherein he has actually dedicated a chapter to you and, and what he's learned from you over the years being friends with you, right? Uh, He's a great investor and a human being as 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 we come as we come across reading his book, right? What what according to you have been your biggest learnings from Guy over the years? 
Yeah, no, I think Guy has been a wonderful friend. And uh, we have a lot of fun when we're together. And uh, I think I think uh, the thing I find amazing about Guy is how uh, little he touches his portfolio. You know, he, he says it's a great year when no changes are made. And uh, and so, for, for example, like, you know, this is something that I've always, um, that has always uh, kind of bothered me. And I have a lot of discussions with him about it. So, for example, Guy has owned Nestle forever. Okay. And I tell him, Guy, there's no meat on that board. There are like, you know, 30 analysts tracking the stock. And it's, you know, it's priced to perfection. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, whatever uh, juice there was has been extracted. Uh, so I would, just, I would just tell him, look, uh, yes, you know, Nestle is a great business. It'll be around even 50 years from now. It's, it's great. But what if we look at uh, the Turkish company, right? So I said, you can't even compare the two, right? So Guy just says to me, there's no way in hell, Monish, that I'm ever putting a dollar into Turkey. Okay, end of end of story, right? He says, I, I, I just don't want to go there. Okay, so the thing is that what I admire about him is that he's he wants to be extremely comfortable in what he owns. He It doesn't bother him if it's suboptimal, which would bother me. Something suboptimal would bother me. Uh, it doesn't bother him. And so I actually have a lot to learn from him uh, because he leaves these things alone for a long time. And I think that's the key is businesses take a while. You know, I think I think to have real change in a business and change in value and growth and all that is decades. It takes a long time. And, uh, and uh, he's very well suited for that. So uh, I, I admire... Uh, very deeply his um, his degree of conviction on these companies like Nestle, for example, and uh, and the willingness to hold them thick and thick or thin. Mm-hmm. Just hold them. That's wonderful. Uh, that's I wonderful. have a lot to learn from that. Sure. The learning still continues. Sure. Uh, so you you've mentioned in one of your talks that uh, passing on your wealth to your kids is a disservice to them because the fun is in the journey and having limited resources carving your own path and figuring it all out right so if not your wealth i'm i'm sure you must have passed on some some very important lessons to your daughters on how to live a good life so what has been your advice to them and and what are some of the key work and life skills that that they or 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 for example any any young person should learn and hone to do well over the next few decades yeah, so I think that's a good question. And I think uh, your kids are not going to learn from what you tell them. Mm-hmm. Your kids are going to learn by observing you. So basically, we are host <laughs> because we can't <laughs> tell them, listen, that's I know true. what is right or wrong. Don't look at me. This is what you should do. Okay. But they're not going to listen to that. That's true. Okay. So, uh, so I think that kids are too smart. Uh, kids are too smart to really, you know, sit down and just take a bunch of lessons from their parents. What we have learned from our parents has been by observation. And what our kids are going to learn from us uh, is by observation. Mm-hmm. That's really kind of, I mean, the actions, actions speak louder than words. Mm-hmm. And so how you have interacted with them, how you interact with others, how you uh, conduct your affairs, all these things. So I'll give you an example. My my daughter has a startup. She just started a, a company that a few other um, she has a few other co-founders, and um, there was there was some um, thing that they wanted to do where she was uh, questioning the ethics. She was, she was not sure whether it's, uh, it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And she was a, so, um, so she came to talk to me about it, right? And uh, 
she described the situation and she said, you know, some people are feeling one way and some people are feeling the other way. And, and then she herself brought up the, uh, the example, which I didn't realize had had a huge impact on her. Um, so when, uh, when Dakshina first started, um, I made a, I made an internal uh, kind of line in the sand. And what I said is that under no circumstances will Dakshina ever give a one rupee bribe ever to anyone, no matter what the circumstances. And the and if we ever hit a brick wall where we can't go without paying, we will shut down all operations and pack up. But we're not going to do things like greater good or anything like that. It's a, it's a hard line, right? And uh, in 2009, we were running a, a hostel in Faridabad in India. And uh, so we had taken this, uh, this place. It was... Uh, and we had kind of transformed it. We put the, our classroom in the basement, whatever. The place needed a higher power connection to satisfy all our, because we had air conditioners running and all of that. So whatever power was coming there, it needed to be upgraded, right? And so we went to the electric company and we said that we need the power upgraded, right? So the guy came and, he showed like a tariff card. You know, if you want so much power, it's so much, so much. And the tariff card, which looked like a tariff card, was actually not a tariff card. It was a bribe card. Okay, so the the, the guy said, look, what we have done in our department, if we just, we just streamlined it. So we don't want someone X pays one bribe and Y pays another bribe. We have made it so all the bribes are the same based on what you are asking for. Mm -hmm. So if you ask for a lot of power, if the bribe is higher, if you ask for less power. So we told them that we are a nonprofit. We're trying to help these poor kids and, you know, we need this power and this is not a, some, you know, commercial enterprise. So please, you know, give us our power. So he said, no, there's, there's no such thing as giving the power. You have to pay. And the bribe was very small. The bribe was less than like 15,000 rupees. It was not a big bribe for us. We could, have, we could have paid the bribe. Nobody would have ever known that we had even paid the bribe, right? If we had wanted to do that. So uh, we were not going to pay that bribe, obviously, because, you know, it's part of our core. But I also need kind of infrastructure that works for us, right? So we could put diesel generators to run the place. And it would give us our electricity and it would give us uh, all our stuff. The, the monthly cost, so we put the diesel generators in. They, was, they created a big racket in the front. It looked ugly. There were a lot of problems with it. Environmentally very negative. And it was costing us uh, 50000 a month in fuel charge to run that diesel generator. It did not bother us at all. So we, that hostel ran for a year. We happily paid the 50,000. That power guy came three, four times after that to tell us, hey, listen, what, is, what are you doing here? This is much cheaper, this and that. But we never did that. So my daughter was actually familiar with that story. And she she brought up, she when she was looking at this dilemma, she said the Dakshina power thing, you know, she said, that's the gold standard. And she said, I want to live at that, at that level. Right. So I said, yeah, if you want to live at that level, then you can't do what you want. These, what, what, if there's even a small question here, then you, you can't do this. Right. And so it made it, it, it made it very, the reason she was feeling uncomfortable is because of that example. The others in her team had never seen something like that. So they didn't have a reference point, you know, and, 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 whatever uh, whatever their life experience had been. But for her, it was very clear. So for her, it was a very clear line in the sand that uh, it has to be a certain way or she can't be part of it. You know, and uh, so I, I would just say that I, I would have had zero impact hmm. on my kids if I told them, please be honest. Please don't give bribes. None of that means anything. So, you know, exactly. so I think, I think you have to actually, 
uh, practice it. And the amazing thing is that I didn't expect that she will be aware of that issue and that it is like out of all the, because, you know, we've had so many instances in India with Dakshana, with bribes uh, that, you know, and and it's a, and the team knows it. Everyone knows that we deal with it. We deal with all the hurdles that come, you know. But but we've never paid a bribe. You know that's pretty pretty cut and dry. And we we deal with whatever consequences come out of that. And uh, and 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 it's okay. So I think that's the important thing with your kids. I think I think uh, they they are observing you when you think you're not being observed. And uh, and they know everything about everything that you're doing. So it's, it's uh, you know, you're fully exposed. I'm sure. I'm sure. I think I, I think that's, <laughs> great, <yeah. laughs> uh, uh, that's a great lesson in parenting, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so moving from, from, from the advice that you uh, uh, would want to give your kids uh, to the advice that you received from your parents, I think I was reading uh, the Dhando Investor again. And uh, you, you've talked about how your father uh, uh, started 15 different companies and bankrupted them all in all different 15 different sectors, industries, right? And you also mentioned that by the time you were 18, since your father was taking you on sales calls and everything, you, you'd already completed many MBAs, right? So what, what core lessons did you learn at that, uh, if I may call it the Pabrai Business School, that have really uh, stood the test of time and that you're still applying with success today? So that's one thing about your father. About your mother, my question is, you've, you've talked about her back of the envelope accounting things that she was doing, right, in those days, right? So any lessons from there as well would be helpful of how you apply them today. Yeah, so I think I did not realize this till much later in life, but you know, the the human brain is optimally set up to specialize between the age of like, let's say 12 and 19. It, in that window of time, actually, the, so the, the brain is the fastest growing organ after we are born. Uh, it's, it grows faster than any other organ for the first five years of life because the birth canal is too narrow. So the brain is the most underdeveloped uh, kind of uh, organ we have when we're born. And it goes through very rapid change in the first five years and massive expansion. From 12 to 19, actually, those neuron connect connections get cut. It's actually cutting a lot of stuff. And it's driving, willing to give a large part of the brain to one act, one area, one activity. Uh, so if you have a interest or specialty in that window, uh, the brain is just perfectly set up. And that window starts closing once we pass 20 or so on. So the way our education system is set up, we are forced to be jack of all trades till we are past 18. You know, then you can start specializing. In India, at least maybe after 16, you can start specializing. But basically, that window is gone. Okay, nothing happens. So you know, Michelangelo, he started when he was like nine or 10 and Buffett, Buffett said that, you know, he was wasting his time till he was 11 when he bought his first stock and Bill Gates was programming when he was 11 or 12. And you can see a lot of examples of people who've done really well where they had uh, a lot of experience in their, in their teen years. And so I was going through an education system, which makes me a jack of all trades. But in that window of time, uh, my my father was running these small businesses. They would get into trouble and he had nobody. There was literally nobody to talk to. And so he he would sit down with my brother and me after the age of 12 or 13. And he would go through, you know, the issues the business was having. And we had to come up with how to make it survive for one more day. Okay. All the walls are caving in. Everything is collapsing. You know, the creditors are coming, everything is like going the, the, and the ship is sinking. How do we make it work one more day? And then we'd make it work, make, make it work for one more day. And again, at night we'd sit, how do we make it work for one more day? Okay. So when you are going through those types of discussions, you are completing many MBAs every week. Okay. <laughs> because everything under the sun is being looked at. Sales is looked at, payroll is looked at, receivables, cash, bank, overdrafts, everything gets looked at. Um, and then I think uh, after I was like 15 or 16, uh, he would he would take take us on sales calls. I and mean, one of us would actually run the business. The other one, would, one, my brother, we would go back and forth. And, and I was able to observe 
how he's going into these businesses. Like he was literally cold calling, right? You walk into a shop and say, do you want this jewelry, this and that, whatever, right? So they didn't know him, nothing, right? And I saw how he built those relationships and they became customers and then they became friends and, you know, just uh, that whole uh, transformation and how many doors just get slammed on your face, right? They're not interested. So I think that the the thing is that it's it's a really, it was really powerful uh, lesson that I didn't realize other people didn't have. Uh, because I think, I think a lot of people in investing, uh, they've never run a business and they, you know, look at things through a spreadsheet. Uh, you really have no idea what's going on. Then. I mean, you're like you're floating on some vaporware. And, uh, and, even when you, uh, when I was running my, when I when I started running my first business, and such, those lessons were so uh, transformational because I understood very well um, what area needs the most work. So the, the the thing that these startup businesses need a lot of expertise is is on the front end to bring in the sales, the marketing and the sales. Uh, you can cover everything else after that is going on. Uh, so, but a lot of people, what they do is they focus so much on what they like to do, build a product or this and that, and they don't want to deal with the sales and because it's very frustrating, a lot of failure, right? And so they just don't want to deal with that. And then you're done, you, the business is never going to go anywhere. Uh, so I think there, was, there were tremendous lessons that came from my dad. Uh, and I don't think he was trying to do this in this way. Maybe he was, I'm not, I'm not sure, but, uh, it was definitely, uh, I mean, uh, my life trajectory would be vastly inferior, uh, without that. And then my, uh, my mom has too many good qualities to, to list. I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, she was very quick on the, the, the high level math and, you know, just the motor hisab type stuff. And, um, uh, and I think this. I think the main lessons I learned from her is that just her, the way she dealt with people and relatives and friends, and she just had a very large circle of people who had extreme goodwill for her. Uh, so very benevolent, very very generous person. Uh, so there were there were tremendous lessons from both of them. So Beautiful. Quite a blessed situation to have two of them in my life. Sure, I'm sure. Right. Uh, what is the single best piece of advice you ever got? So this is like a uh, this is like a rapid fire. Uh, uh, what is the single best piece of advice you ever got? Um, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> Let me come back to that. Sure. Go go what's to the a, next one. Sure. What's the single worst piece of advice you ever got? Uh, I mean, I I think you get a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, negative advice from people, right? You know, you want to do something, they'll tell you not to do it and this and that. So there's a uh, hundred different things you hear from people, which, uh, so worst advice comes all the time. Right. Are you sure? Uh, uh, I think this should be simple, maybe. If you have to keep just one book with you and give away all others permanently, which one book would you keep and why? Uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac. Okay. Uh, I would keep that. And... Uh, and and uh, but but keep going. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, I have one final closing question. Uh, have you thought about the best advice that you ever got? Yeah, the best advice. Actually, I was going to say that the best advice I ever got was uh, from my dad uh, when I was uh, working. Uh, I I was working in in the in a in a job. My my only only job I had, and um, he said it's time to quit. You know. And I said, uh, he said, it's time to quit and start your own business. So I had decided actually before I, um, when I started my career that I would never be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I just seen too much turmoil with being an entrepreneur. So I, I told him that uh, uh, I have a very good job. I have a good savings rate, 401k, all of that. And it's a great trajectory for the next 40 years, don't need to rock the boat. Uh, so he said, no, you need to quit, you know? And, um, and I realized uh, after several weeks that he was right. 
So, so, and and when I told him that, have you forgotten what we went through? He said, yeah, but that's what makes life life interesting. You know, he just said that's if we didn't have that, it would be so boring. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, uh, so, Monish, here's my closing question to you. Uh, most of the time, most of us have no idea who we are. And, and like you said in a past talk, we, we do not have an owner's manual that guides us in how we should live. And most of our life is spent actually conforming to how others think we should live. Right. So just as a thought experiment, if you, design, if you were designated by God to design an owner's manual about how humans should live their life generally, and based on all you've learned from Warren Charlie and through your own experiences, what would you put on that owner's manual? Well, what I would what I would put in the owner's manual, first of all, it's it's it it would be different for each person, right? I mean, Absolutely. that's the whole point. We're all very different. But what I would what I would tell people, uh, or what I would put in the owner's manual is, uh, pay very close attention to what excites you, and what irritates you, and what upsets you, and what you know energizes you. Things that give you a lot of energy, you want to increase that big time in your life. And things that are draining you, you want to get rid of that. So don't worry about, you know, the world The world doesn't need another painter or doesn't need another poet or whatever else. Uh, just pursue what gives you uh, the, most, the most joy and satisfaction and growth. And, and, and be very deliberate when things happen when you do something, go back and look at how you feel about that experience. So I think if you continue to do that as you went through life, so if you're sampling a lot of things, uh, then you're going to find that some things really resonate and a lot of things don't. And so just keep going deeper and deeper into the areas that resonate with you. And that's basically the owner's manual. Without without spending ten thousand dollars with Jack Skeen, I'm sure. I'm sure. the other the, the better answer is to go do it with Jack Skeen. Uh -huh. So uh, I think with with that, uh, thank you so much, Man Manish, for for being a great teacher all these years, right? And 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 I must congratulate you and thank you for the uh, wonderful work that you and your team are doing at Dakshina, right? Uh, bringing up so many lives positively. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It has been an insightful conversation. Uh, uh, thank you so much for everything, Manish. Vishal, I always uh, enjoy enjoy the way you interact with uh, uh, Joe public and make them into better investors. I, I, I feel very uh, sad when I look at most people uh, just don't have the basics. They're smart people. They're good people. They want to get there. And it, through all the learnings that they went through, this piece is basically missing. So you're you're filling a great void, which is wonderful. And thanks, Monish. Yeah. Great, you're wearing a great looking shirt. Oh yeah, thanks for the gift. I, I should mention it again. I think this this is the Dakshina shirt which Monish has sent. Uh, so I'm I'm highly grateful, and it fits me well. <laughs> All right, that's great. Somehow we got your size right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Great, great. So thank you, Monish. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Take care, Monish. Bye.